When we sin and we run away from God, we aren't so much following a plan as letting an instinct kick in. So it's a little bit hard to be precise about what we're looking for. But it's probably fair to say that we want a place where we can feel good about ourselves again, somewhere that we're not being reminded of our true calling to be blessed by God and be a blessing to the whole world. So we're looking for a place where what we do really doesn't matter and the people around us really don't matter. And now as Judah finds out in Genesis 38 um, when he goes down to Adullam, there is no such place. A fact which God demonstrates to him through his pagan Canaanite daughter-in-law. Tamar becomes not just the means of putting Judah back on the right track with God, but is also eventually named in the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew 1.3. You can run to the place where God is not just as hard as you like, but when you arrive you tend to find that he's there ahead of you. And this is another of those repeating patterns that we find in God's word. Israel sins as a nation and instead of repenting, she runs. She runs to other gods. She treats her own poor as though they don't matter. She runs for protection to other local rulers. And finally, almost inevitably, Israel goes into exile. She loses the promised land. Perhaps the ultimate symbol to her of God's blessing is gone. Now, being in exile might bring them to their senses like in Jesus' story of the prodigal son in the pig pen. But of course, it also might provide them with what they were looking for all along, a place where they can believe what they do doesn't matter because they think they're amongst people who don't matter. Hey, in Babylon, who cares if you keep the Ten Commandments or not? So repentance is not guaranteed. Now when Jesus arrives, the exile is still going on. Yes, there's a lovely temple in Jerusalem and sacrifices are being offered there every day. But the place is crawling with Roman soldiers, any one of whom can call you away from whatever you are doing and make you carry his gear for a mile along the highway. Humiliating. So, just as long as you see the soldiers, the exile goes on. And when you see those soldiers, how do you think of them? Surely they are the ultimate people who don't matter, aren't they? If you know that the exile will truly end one day with the restoration of God's people and the destruction of God's enemies, which is exactly what God promises in Jeremiah 30, for instance, then you know that these men are doomed. They are Satan's cannon fodder in the last great battle. Harass them if you can, avoid them if you can't, cooperate with them only if you absolutely must. But Jesus shows that if you think like this, then the real reason that the exile continues doesn't lie with the Roman soldiers, but with God's own unrepentant people. In Matthew 5, 41, he tells his followers that if someone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. And in verse 44, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And then in Matthew 8, 5 to 13, a centurion comes to him asking for help. Now that in itself is an act of humility. Centurions don't have to ask. Jesus volunteers to go. Cue a sharp intake of breath, doubtless, from the crowd. This is collaboration, isn't it? The centurion then proceeds to show the depth of his faith. He is a man who owes his position and his own authority and his earthly security to Caesar, but here he is addressing Jesus as Lord and ascribing ultimate authority to him. No wonder Jesus describes it as such great faith. Here is the turkey who voted for Christmas. And Jesus is not slow to make the point to those following him. A lot of them are hoping Jesus proves to be the Messiah because they think the coming of the Messiah will put them on top of the world and wipe out all the opposition. But would you give your support to the man who comes in God's name to end power games like yours? in favour of justice and holiness? That's the question they will have to answer. I say to you, says Jesus, that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now are they still wanting the exile to end and Messiah to come and rule 
and God's enemies to be swept away, even though it means they go from hero to zero? Well, maybe. And if so, they have finally learned repentance instead of running away. And the example to follow was that of this centurion. If you have been, thank you.